Good morning. A very warm welcome to our service here at St Jude's today. We're following the order of service in the pink booklet, which you've hopefully got, and again, we follow it fairly closely. God's grace and peace are with us. Let our hearts be filled with joy. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, give us a vision of your glory that we may worship you in spirit and in truth and offer the praise of glad and thankful hearts through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 612 in our book, We Have a Gospel to Proclaim. Please be seated. Let's take a few moments to call to mind the ways in which we have fallen short of God's love. <coughs> Lord Jesus, you came into the world to save sinners. Lord, have mercy. We have brought sorrow and hurt to you, to others and to ourselves. Christ, have mercy. You give yourself to heal and renew us, and to bring us strength. 
Lord, have mercy. I invite you to stand to hear the promise that we are forgiven. God is love and forgives our sins through Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth, through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. We're going to listen to our Bible reading now, and it's taken from Acts chapter 4. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. The whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Diana. I invite you to stand as we listen to our Gospel reading. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St John. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord Jesus, said to them, Again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We've heard two stories there in our Bible readings this morning, both quite familiar in in one sense, um, but one of them didn't go quite as far as I thought it was going 
to. I've obviously got my numbers wrong when I was looking at the passage from Acts. Because the story in Acts goes on to tell another bit of the story, which was about a man known as Barnabas. Barnabas was one of the early disciples. Or one of the early followers of, of Jesus. And his story is quite interesting because he was clearly quite wealthy. He was a Jew, but he'd travelled. He'd gone to Cyprus and he lived on the island of Cyprus. But the point in the story where we get to meet him, he's come back into, um, uh, onto the mainland and he's there and he's meeting with other people and they're sharing the story of what happened so far as Jesus was concerned. And we read that, um, that we read there that people in the church or that those early believers gave everything that they had or combined things so that they shared what they got. And that was quite uh, an unusual thing, I guess, for people to come together and share in that way. But Barnabas is picked out. For some reason, they tell us exactly what happens as far as Barnabas is concerned. It turns out that Barnabas, as I say, was fairly rich land and he sold it and he got the proceeds from that sale and he gave the money to the, the, that early church and they used it to support people and as we read in that passage um, they, they shared everything. There was nobody needy in that group. Now I guess for the early church that was fairly straightforward because there weren't that many people maybe a few thousand, I don't know. But even if you've sold a plot of land, that money isn't going to last forever. And once you've spent it, you've spent it. You can't get it back again. So how do you keep something like that going? Of course, there's another story shortly afterwards where somebody else sold something and they took the proceeds and they, they took it in and uh, it turned out that they weren't quite honest about it. They only gave some of the profit and they kept a bit of it for themselves and that uh, upset people uh, in the church. And if you want to read that, just follow that passage through in Acts and you'll find out what happened. And you might not be very happy when you learn what happened to them. But that's another story. I'm thinking about Barnabas. There's Barnabas. And he says, I'm so impressed with this story about Jesus that actually I want to show how much I love and how I want to um, become part of the community supporting Jesus. So there's Barnabas, that's one part of the story. And then the other part of the story is about Thomas, poor old Thomas. I was talking to Jenny before the service. He's the person that we know is the one who doubted, isn't he? Doubting Thomas, and we often refer to that. Jenny said, why don't we talk about the denial of Peter and say how bad he was? And actually you can say, by a few of the other disciples as well. Um, what happened when Jesus was arrested? They all ran away. They didn't support Jesus. They weren't there when he could desperately have uh, managed with or uh, welcomed support. The interesting thing, I think, about Thomas is that uh, he was actually quite keen on supporting Jesus. If you remember that scene at Lazarus, Tomb, Thomas is the one who says, when Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem, Thomas says, let's go with him and we'll die with him there, because actually that's what he's heading for. It's not very, not very happy, it's a sad story, but Thomas is supporting Jesus and he says, I'll go with him. So where's the doubt there? What happened? What turned Thomas around? that he found himself when he was faced with a story which was completely unbelievable, that he said, until I see it, until I've got the proof, I'm just not interested. I need some proof. And of course, it was a week later after the disciples had told him that he met with Jesus and his life was turned upside down. His response is one, again, of total commitment, just like Barnabas, Thomas says, my Lord and my God, and you get the impression that he was going to serve Jesus from then on in. One other interesting thing about what the disciples did and how things moved forward. Do you remember when Jesus was going to be taken up into heaven? They went to the Mount of Olives and they're standing there, having a conversation with Jesus, and Matthew records, some of them doubted. So that word doubt important. It's easy to doubt. If you 
you've not got the facts and the evidence in front of you. And that's why Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are those people who don't see and yet still believe. And who are those people? It's you and me. We are those people. We are blessed. Isn't that good news? We are blessed because we have accepted something that we know, that we have no proof to say that's actually what happened. We, we never met Jesus. Even Paul met him in a vision. But we may have had experiences, but we didn't have the experience of those early disciples. And neither did Barnabas. Barnabas too was a person who came to faith without actually having that personal experience. But as I say, Barnabas was one of many who joined the community. And they quickly realised they needed to support each other. They needed to have a mechanism, which is why they shared what they got. His outlook on life was to support and help those around him. And he did that on this particular occasion. So given those two reactions to Jesus, Thomas who says, I believe because I've seen, and Barnabas who says, not only do I believe, but I want to turn that into a reality. I want to show how my belief affects what I do in my everyday life. And that's really what I'd like to explore, just for a quick moment now. When we recognise Jesus as our Lord, as both Thomas and Barnabas did, it will make a difference. But sometimes it's difficult to work out what we can do to honour and serve our God. And there might be a need to look beyond our front door to people, to the needs of people outside. And I've got brought some items with me this morning, which I hope are going to help us explore that a bit. Um, they might not be obviously linked, but that doesn't matter. What I've got here is... a biro, I've got a bottle of water, I've got a book, and I've got a watch. Three things. Now you're saying to yourself, what on earth is Andrew doing this week? Um, and I'm not quite sure, but there we are. We'll see where it goes. There are things we, we've all got. We've all got things like those around our houses, haven't we? The question I'm asking you is, which one of those would you find easy to give away? If somebody came to you and said, I need, would you be willing, let's see, first of all, would you be willing to give up or offer somebody a biro? My guess is you probably would, because you've got hundreds of them knocking around. And the chances are, some of the biros you've got have been given to you by other people as well, because you've got, oh, I need a pen, I need a pen. It says, I've got one. Don't bother to give it me back. Biros, they're easy, aren't they? Come and go. So that's an easy thing to share. Do you remember what Jesus said about water? Offer a glass of water to somebody in the name of Jesus and Jesus recognises that gift. So if somebody came to you and said, can I have some water? My guess is you would say, yeah, that's okay. You can have some water. And you might go and get that your tap or you might pop down the shop or give them a bottle of something like that. So probably difficult to do that. The book here um, is the first edition. So it cost eight and six. <laughs> eight and six. Can you even work out what eight and six is? I was thinking, is that less than a pound? Yeah, it is. It's, no less than, it's less than 50p. So this book, when it was published, was worth less, or could be bought for less than 50p. Paid for it because it was considerably more than eight and six. Would I willingly give this book up? Hmm. I don't know. If somebody said to me, I need to go out, I'm desperate, I need I need some money to pay my rent for this week. Chances are that book's got enough money in it to pay the rent for somebody for a week. Would I give it up? I don't know. I haven't finished reading it yet. But there we are. It's a value. 
Biro, yeah, give those away, that's no problem. Water, yeah, you can have a glass of water. Book, hmm, maybe not. So that's looking at, 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 as, as an individual level. What about a collective level? What do we do as a church to support our community and the people round about us? What can we do? And I want to tell you a story about um, a deacon in the Methodist church. Her name's Eunice Atwood. And she told a story in the year that I was ordained. And she mentioned this church up north somewhere. And she said there was a lady in this church who was desperate. She hadn't got enough money. She, she was in, 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 in real trouble. Um, and one morning there was a knock at her door and she went down to open the front door and there on the, on the, on the floor in front of the, on, on the doorstep was a casserole. She took the casserole in and she ate it. She didn't know where it came from. There was a knock on the door the next day and there was another casserole and the next day and the next day and the next day. And it actually took quite a long time before it became a that those casseroles came from the local church. Somebody in the community knew that she was in need, shared that need with the church, and the church said, we care enough about you that we want you to know that this gift comes to you from us because of our love for God. Certainly that was a factor in the process that enabled that gift to become a reality. And that woman eventually became part of the fellowship in that church, which is why I guess the story is well known. And again, we, we experience that today. That's not an unusual thing to happen. So there we are. What do we do? And what are we willing to give up for our God? And, and are we, how thankful are we for what God has done for us in sharing what we've got with other people as individuals and as a church. My last story, I'm not sure if I've told you this story before, but it's worth telling again. It's about a watch. It was actually a very, very expensive watch, this particular one. And I'd been up in Trafalgar Square with some friends of mine, and we'd been preaching there on the plinth, as we did a couple of times a year. And the chap that was preaching um, did, did, his, did his preach, did his talk, and he came down off the plinth, and a, a homeless person came up to him and he said, put your money where your mouth is. You've got a really expensive watch on your wrist. Give it to me. What would you have done? I was standing by the gentleman, as, well, by, by the two of them, as uh, the story unfolded. And I could see my friend hesitate. Was he going to do it? Was he going to share or give that watch away? Or was he going to hold on to it? Was he going to come up with some good excuse as to why it was totally inappropriate? Like, well, you'll only go and spend it on drugs or alcohol. Why should I do that? But he took the watch off and he gave it to the man. I've never seen anybody run so fast in all my life. He shot off out of the square and never saw him again. Does that matter? That person has to live with that story. It was a few years ago now. But it asks gives me the question, what do I do? How thankful am I to God for what God has done for me? Without the proof that Thomas had. But even Thomas eventually did have the proof and he went on to share the message of the love of God with people. But also the fact that Barnabas actually became the reality of that. Barnabas was known as the encourager. And he did that by giving people the things that they needed and sharing the message of the love of God. How thankful are we for what God has done for us? All the things we have, God has given to us. Okay, we've earned them, we've worked for them, we've made them, whatever it might be. But they are God's gift to us. How much of that are we willing to give back to God the appropriate point in our lives when somebody comes along and says I need that I'm in desperate states and they might not ask you for a watch they might ask you for a casserole but I wonder when you're asked the question how will you respond to the gift that God has given to you and of course the gift that God gave to us was his son and we've reflected upon that already this morning so I encourage you to think about how thankful you are for what God has done for you. 
Amen. I invite you to stand and declare our faith this morning. We say together, We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Amen. Please be seated. Judith is going to share some prayers with us now. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Andrew. Let's think about being thankful and what we can share. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fellowship and friendship we find in our life together at St. Jude's. Help us to be people who share those blessings, who care for one another with generous welcome and warm kindness, and who are constantly on the lookout for those who may be uncertain, lonely, or isolated. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the promises of Easter, for the forgiveness won by Jesus on the cross, for the presence of the risen Lord Jesus in our lives, and for the promise of life eternal. Help us to live in the joy of Easter and to share that joy with others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the peace and the freedom that we enjoy in this country. Hear us as we cry to you once again for those who live with war every day and those who suffer and die in the terrible circumstances of conflict. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for health and strength to greet each new day. We pray for those who are unwell at this time, and we pray for some of the people especially on our list today. For Annie, coming to the end of life's journey here. For Paddy, rejoicing in the good news of healing. For Aidan, and with aid and also for Liz and Janet and Ruth. For David, for Hannah, for Michelle, for Sarah, for Morag and for Kathy. And for all known to us who are unwell at this time. We pray for your healing presence with them. We pray especially too for those who are grieving because someone they love has died. We pray especially for Mark and Tina, Harley and Tommy, following the death of Daphne, for whom we have been praying for many weeks. May this family be surrounded by the comfort of your love and comfort with them too the family of Barry Wintour, who has died very recently. We pray that they may find in you their comfort and their hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a new week and for all the opportunities that it will bring. We pray especially for our school children and their families and their teachers all enjoying a break now. We pray for ourselves that we may be good stewards of the time that you give to us and that we may be ever grateful for the blessing that life brings. 
merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Judith, for sharing those prayers with us this morning. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I leave you peace. My peace I give to you. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. We sing together number 305, I come with joy, a child of God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. God our Father, we give you thanks and praise for all that you have made, for the stars in their splendour, and the world in its wonder, and for the glorious gift of human life. With the saints and angels in heaven, we praise your holy name. Holy God, you go on loving us even when we turn away from you. You sent your Son Jesus, who healed those who were sick, wept with those who were sad, and forgave sinners. To show the world your love, he died for all on the cross, and you raised him up in glory. On the night before Jesus died, he had supper with his disciples. He took bread, thanked you as we are thanking you, broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take Eat, this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took a cup of wine, thanked you and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, 
it will be shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this to remember me. And so, God of love, we remember that Jesus died and rose again to make all things new. Through his offering for us all, we offer our whole life to you in thanks and praise. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us Christ's saving body and blood. May this same Spirit unite us with all your people on earth and in heaven. Bring us at last to live in your glory with all your saints, that we may praise you forever through Jesus, your Son, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. be seated. We say together the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. When we break the bread, we share in the body of Christ. Christ is the bread of life. When we give thanks for the cup of blessing, we share in the blood of Christ. Christ is the true vine. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed.
Lord God, our Father, through our Saviour Jesus Christ, you have assured your children of eternal life and in baptism have made us one with him. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in your love, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. God of glory, we have seen with our eyes and touched with our hands the bread of heaven. Strengthen us in our life together that we may grow in love for you and for each other. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We have some notices. Thank you. Firstly, a reminder that our Wednesday Holy Communion service is now back to its original time of 10 a.m. with no lunch. Um, next Saturday, the church will be open in the afternoon between 2 and 4. And then we have our services on Sunday at 8 a.m., 9.30, and then Compline via Zoom at 6 o'clock in the evening. The SHIP is available online and details of all these services are available in the SHIP. If you don't receive the SHIP via email, please let somebody know and we can arrange that for you. And finally, if you can stay for refreshments after this service, um, we have coffee and cake available in the Monsal Room. And I believe Judith has some Bands of Marriage to publish. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Claudia. I'm very conscious that there are people in church today who are going through really difficult times. We also have people who are looking forward to a time of great celebration. I'm very honored to read these particular bands because of the two families coming together. One of those families I have only ever previously met in sad and difficult circumstances, and I am honoured to be able to read your bands this morning. I published The Bands of Marriage between Paul Adrian Thompson of the parish of St Peter's Cranbourne Ascot and Victoria Anne Bellchamber of the parish of St Peter's Cranbourne Ascot. This is for the first time of asking if any of you know any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. Let's just pray for them. Heavenly Father, thank you for Victoria and for Paul, for bringing them together in love for one another. We pray for them in these remaining weeks as they prepare for their marriage. We pray that they may know your blessing and be drawn even closer to each other because of the love that they share. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Judith. <coughs> Our closing this morning is number 513, Lord, the light of your love.
May the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.